Welcome to welcome to our law business finance webinar. We are going to run a quite a number of webinars that will assist you guys um, with the course. Uh, let me share our slides. Uh, I'm going to also uh, switch off uh, the camera and uh, I'm going to share the slides. Um, okay, so yes, welcome to Law Business Finance. This is our first webinar and I'll be running a, a couple of uh, webinars for our course, which is part of uh, the practice management training. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Faustina Caserera. I am a chartered accountant and a registered auditor. I run a small practice uh, where I offer accounting, tax and uh, audit services. Okay, but uh, yeah, my auditing more more of um, limited uh, services because it's a small practice. Okay, um, I have been uh, running up courses. Uh, we collaborating with the Law Society and I've been facilitating uh, the courses for them and uh, recording some webinars. So I will be facilitating this one for you just uh, to help you so that when you attend to your assignment at least you have some insight as well is also to give you more pointers when it comes to how to run your businesses okay um so the course uh, basically uh, how it is administered it's offered by law society of south africa and uh, you have an administrator who has been helping you all along who has registered you and um, I think she has introduced you to the online platform and you were finished with your username and password and you are able to log in and um, on the online platform that is where you get most of uh, the information. I am going to stop sharing this a bit so that I can be, give you a bit of um, a glimpse of uh, the online platform. Uh, let me share the online platform. Okay, so um, this is our online platform. Obviously, this is my view, and uh, you do have your own uh, student view. So, with your own uh, student view, you should be able to see the tab which is um, the PMT 2024-1. This is the tab that you should be able to see. So on that tab, there's an overview. On the overview, you are given information about uh, the course, the, basically the PMT, and also you are given the announcement, you find them on the right. So you need to frequently get onto the system and check if you have opted out for emails, you find you do not get uh, email notifications. But if you have um, a email notifications, then whenever there is an announcement, then you should get uh, a, an email. So this is where you get, if you click on announcements, you should be able to see uh, the announcements that are, uh, have been published you should be able to see uh, your program like in this case uh, let's go back to the announcement okay this, this is uh, the view from my end i can more i can amend but from your end i guess you won't basically see uh, the modification dates and everything but you should be able to see uh, the the notifications that are there and if you click on them you can get more information it's either on the overview or when you come here then you get more information like in this case there is a practice management training program plan so this is the plan you should go through it uh, as you can see here 
you are told that there is accessibility to online lectures, which is basically like this one that I'm given, and um, communication with the instructor. You can see that you do it through the forum. So they're going to create a forum where we do communicate um, when you want anything, when you've got questions. Okay, and then uh, recording of attendance and then PMT modules. These are the modules and this particular module is uh, the law business finance, which I am facilitating for you. And you have your quizzes that you should attend to and um, you should show that you have attended. So go through this and uh, the, the schedule and then you know your timelines. Okay, and then when it comes to resources, uh, in our case for low business finance, we make use of a study guide. So this study guide for you, you should be able to come under resources. And if you can scroll down, it's a written uh, module. I think it's uh, module three, low business finance 2024 v1 smaller so this is our module so this is our um, study guide if you click on it you should be able to download it in pdf and then when it comes to assignments then you should be able to when they upload the assignments when you click on assignments you should be able to see whenever they open the assignments you should be able to download them from there and then you get your test and quizzes when you go under test and quizzes and then your grade book when you're done, you get your grade book. And then they will add in a, they, they, they will add in the forum, a, the forum that's where we will be communicating from. A, so this is the online platform. This is where you will be working on, the working from the, and getting more information from. Okay, thank you. So I'll stop uh, sharing the online platform and I will go back to our presentation. Our presentation. Okay. All right. So I have indicated uh, that you should ask questions on the forum. Uh, this will also benefit other other students because whatever that you would have asked other students are able to also give you information they are also give even give able to respond to you and also the facilitator is able to see and once we answer one question you find everyone else benefits and when it comes to admin matters anything to do with admin you need to contact Eugenia at the LSSA I think you've got an email address you've got a telephone numbers when you started with the course you were dealing with it so make sure you contact her so that she can attend to any issues that you might be having yes so yes welcome to our web to our course which is the law business finance and uh, on it we have an assignment so it's not assignments it's an assignment so at the end of it all you have to submit an assignment and this assess assignment is due for assessment and the assessment will lead to your final mark and your final mark has to be above 50 percent for them to say you have passed the course Okay, so when it comes to the assignment, you will see it online, you will download it, you are given time to attend to it offline, you don't have to do it immediately, and then after attending to it, your answer, you are supposed to make sure that you type it either in Word or in Excel, and then or you can handwrite but we do not encourage because you know it's difficult to read handwriting but best would be for you to type it in and then after you type it in you have to convert it into pdf so we have got an online an online marking tool we've got 
a marking tool that we use uh, to, to, to mark the assignments. So they only allow us to mark when it's in PDF. So make sure that you convert into PDF. And as part of your submission, please include your declaration in the same PDF, either is page one or it can be the last page. Okay, and uh, when it comes to your assignment, you should make sure that your assignments do not come with passwords, because if it comes with a password, you won't be able to open up. Just it being on your profile, it's a proof enough, no one, no one else will be able to access it because you get into your profile using a password, a, a username and a password. So it's good enough for your assignment, it's secure. You don't have to put a password. And also ensure that your PDF does not come blocked for, 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 for editing because the marking, it's more of like you're editing because we need to put comments, we need to also indicate um, the other things that you, you would have missed out. So make sure that it's not secured your PDF is not um, having a, 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 a password that will limit us in terms of our work. Okay, and um, I have shown you where you get to, to, to the study guide, where you get the study guide. Okay, when it comes to the study guide, please make sure you download. It's a study guide or it's a manual. You download it, you go through it. It's very informative. It's um, a very educational for you guys, especially when you want to start a practice, you need to understand a lot, especially things to do with the rules, things to do with the uh, financial management. So please go through the guide. It has got examples and uh, where you feel you do not understand, then you go onto the forum, you indicate, then we give you further explanations. Okay, so our lecture, this one, we are not going to go through the study guide since you already have the study guide. So it is just going to be a rundown, more of like skeletons on a, for you to be able to answer and also for you to be able to grasp some info that would have touched on. We won't touch on everything because we will not be able to, to finish. Okay, and... Um, the other thing is that um, accounting uh, is made up of theories and is it, is it is made up of theories. When you look at our subject, we will start with theories, we will start with the rules. So you need to read and understand these theories. And the accounting th theories are just the same as the ones that you e encountered when you were at school so it's um basically we start with the basics of bookkeeping and uh, the definitions of bookkeeping accounting and then from there we more of like try to move and align it with the concepts that are applicable in your in your type of industry because we've got a trust account we've got a business account so once you understand uh these uh, principles and theories and rules, then you should be able to apply them anyway. Even with your day-to-day -day work, you will be able to apply. Okay, so let's move on. And um, our next, let's look at starting your own business. So the idea of uh, practice management, uh, the, the, the reason why they introduce the course is that they want to ensure that you are empowered. So how do you get empowered when you're starting your own practice or when you are moving out of a practice that you have been? You would find um, in that practice, you most of the things were in place or you joined in as a junior, you joined in, you saved your articles, you became a candidate attorney, you moved from there, you became a junior attorney, you became a senior attorney, most probably you were not attending to uh, these financial issues of the practice, you were not attending to all the other aspects of business. So the idea of um, L, 
SSA is that they want you to be empowered so that when you run your practice, you do not encounter challenges. Okay, so our lecture will focus mainly on the assignment, but what we also want to do is to empower you on running your business. So we'll give you some pointers, we include some pointers to say, okay, yeah, this is how you are supposed to do it. So this is not more of like limited to bookkeeping, but when we look at your level, we are now more of like talking about finances. So it will be a, 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 a bit of bookkeeping moving into financial management so that you are able to run your business, so that you are able to control the resources that you have, you are able to run the trust account. Okay. So let's look at why um, businesses fail. So you find um, we've got uh, challenges where uh, when you look at uh, businesses, they are more of like um, run uh, in such a way that uh, when you are starting, someone has to be there. Someone has to give direction to the business. So in your case, when you are starting, you are still alone. And when you are alone, you have to then appoint uh, people that are going to assist you. If you do not do that, then it means you are going to run the business and it would require longer working hours. And that is not more of like ideal uh, for you to work for longer hours. So you would need to then appoint probably have a receptionist, uh, have um, a messenger who is going to assist you with dropping documents. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard work. So you would find if you do not manage it well, then that can lead to you not coping, you uh, breaking down because you have been running for hours. And the other thing is that you need to source clients. If you're starting your own practice, you will need to source clients. And that is the major thing because clients bring in cash flow and the cash flow that is what you use to continue running, to remunerate yourself, to pay rent house, to buy equipment. You need to have clients and those clients, they need servicing. And the servicing of clients require the resources and those resources it might mean employing and um, if you do not have clients then you'd find you will not succeed as a business so when you are starting up your business you need to more like map the, the, the and look at what is it that you are going to be doing uh, the field that you are going to to specialize on and if you can do that, then you start marketing. If you're going to be general, a general practitioner who does everything, you might find you want to have direction. So, or you will need to have a lot of, to do a lot of advertising so that clients are able to locate you, okay? So that is a major issue. And then the other thing is that when you start a practice, you will need to set a lot of controls. You need to have controls in terms of um, internal controls, accounting controls. You need to have processes in place. You need to have procedures in place so that whoever comes in and is to conduct, they know what to do. So you need to have manuals in place that you set in so that whoever is to come and join the firm, you do not have to sit down and uh, teach them without any guidance. Okay, so you need to read, read more on internal controls, Google on that, set up your practice so that your practice is secure. And then the other thing is that you will need to constantly check on your employees, on your staff with uh, a practice and especially with a trust account you cannot trust anyone so you will need to constantly check on them whether they are performing 
because uh, when you look at the LPC and they take you as a business person, they say you are overly responsible. So you are responsible. You are supposed to be the one supervising your employees from the general to the seniorest of employees. You need to know what they are doing and you need to put a controls in place so that you can be able to check what they are doing and whether they are not tarnishing your firm, they are not affecting um, anything, but everything is running according to your uh, instructions. So the other thing is that, you know, when you are dealing with uh, juniors, when you are dealing with candidate attorneys and you assign them clients, sorry for that, when you assign them uh, to clients or you tell them to go to court, you would realize, oh, sorry for that. Uh, you would find when you are attending to, you are assigning your, 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 your junior staff, you can give them work to do. You say, go and attend court, go to court, go and uh, lodge these documents. And they, they, they do not go. And the next thing, when they are leaving, you check their drawers, you find everything has been uh, kept in the office. So you need to constantly, you need to keep registers in place so that you know that your matters are being attended to and they do not prescribe. Okay, and uh, the other thing that is crucial is that you need to be in control of the trust account. So you cannot leave your trust account to anyone depending whether you're in a partnership, in an ink, you cannot leave it. You can't say the other director is the one who is running with it because if anything happens, then when it comes to the LPC, they will hold you accountable for the trust account. And, you know, trust account hold money which does not belong to the firm but to other people and it won't look nice. So do not rely on your employees, do not rely on your accountants only. You need to check, you need to put controls in place so that you ensure that everything is tying up. And on your accountants, whatever that they record for you, make sure you also compare with your source documents. You also compare like uh, if you are given a cash book, if you are given financial statements, check your bank statement uh, for your closing balances if they do tie up with what you have been given, because you know some of this information it's given and it's summarized. Okay. All right, let's uh, look at um, business types. Okay, so when it comes to a practice, you can either go solo, you go as a sole practitioner, or you can join with somebody, and then you form a partnership, or you can decide to go and incorporate. Incorporation uh, means registering a company. Okay, so as a sole practitioner, uh, still you need to keep accounting records. You need to maintain and make sure that your records are kept and you are having someone, or if you are doing your, doing it yourself, they are kept up to date, okay? And uh, as a partnership, partnership, it's uh, you come up with an agreement, and the agreement is between you and your partner or your partners, and uh, that agreement that you draft, it's more of like a constitution that you draft, you give each other rules, you explain how things are conducted, how uh, your profits are shared and um, you look at um, how you draw funds as partners. So that document then will guide you on how to run as a partnership and uh, you have to keep it safe and as it, it holds uh, the partners accountable. Okay, and then um, as an incorporation, so according to the act, um, legal practitioners are allowed to register, especially attorneys, uh, advocates. They, I think they are limited to run as uh, so practitioners. I'm not sure about incorporation, but uh, when it comes to attorneys, they can register 
with uh, the company registrar, which is now CIPC or CP. You register with them and uh, to register. This is a special type of registration of a company. You can't just register as a private company, but it's called a personal liability company. Why it is a personal liability company? It's because the directors are also held accountable together with the company. So there's a, an attachment to some personal liability that is there. So in, if you're registering, so registration is it's, it's a bit different, um, e, unlike that one of a private company. So when you're doing it, you more like do it manually. The thing that I know you do is that the name reservation, you can do it online. And then thereafter, you have to complete forms manually. And then those forms are the ones that you submit to CIPC and then they confirm registration. And with the forms that you complete, you have to keep them as part of your company registration documents. Usually when it comes to banks, they require those forms is they also stipulate there is like the COR 15.1B. It's more of like the constitution of the ink. So it stipulates um, the conduct of directors of the company and uh, those things that banks are interested in for them to open accounts with you. Okay. And um, the thing is that uh, with the incorporated previously, most people would go as sole practitioners or they would go as partnerships because every company required to be audited. But now you find there is no requirement for a company to be audited, but uh, they look at turnover and then it guides them into whether you should audit, appoint an auditor, an accountant, or you can actually do your record, you do keep your records and do your reporting internally. So you can look at that. Okay, and um, tax benefits. So let's look at tax benefits of uh, this type of businesses. Okay, so when you are a sole practitioner, you haven't registered anything. So your business, you are practicing under yourself. So it is you trading as, or it is you, you give a name, ABC attorneys. So with that ABC attorneys, it falls under your ID. So when it comes to tax, when we talk about tax, we are talking about income tax. So it's income tax benefit. So when it comes to income tax, then the profits of that business are taxed in the hands of the practitioner at individual rates. So which means when you are doing your annual return, you will need to declare that I run a business. So say for instance, you do part-time, you do say part-time uh, lecturing or you do part-time consultation at some firm and they issue with an IRAP 50 deduct checks on your income and then they issue with an IRAP 5 to file your taxes. So you will need to declare that separate from the business. And if you are running other businesses which you run without registering a company, then you will need to specify on your return and say, okay, I've got two businesses that I'm running. And also if you've got rental properties, I've got rental properties that I do have. So this one of um, this business of uh, legal services you will say okay this is my business and then you have to indicate the income that you have earned for the whole year and you indicate the expenses and then you are left with a profit and then that profit together with any other income that you from other projects that you are doing or from other business ventures from that you are doing then gets taxed together Okay, we'll cover more on income tax on uh, in, in slides that are coming. Okay, and then when it comes to a company, 
companies, they are allocated income tax numbers upon registration. So the moment you register with CIPC, a company is given its income tax number. So the idea of registering a company is to make money as long as it's a profit making company. So if it's not a profit, you will see on the system, they even ask, is this a company, a non-profit making? Then you say, yes. If it's a profit making, then it can be either a private company or an incorporated company. So with companies, they've got tax rates that are gazetted and they are fixed rates that are gazetted. And these fixed rates are applied on the profits at the end of each financial year and from the you pay tax. So currently the tax rate is at 27%. So then it means if you make a profit of 100,000, then they will multiply by 27, then you pay 27,000 towards tax. Okay, and um, other taxes that we look at, we've got VAT and PSUM. So one is to look at um, when to register. Every business, every business, whether run by an individual or run by a, a company should be registered for these taxes as long as you qualify to be registered. Individual partnerships, inks, yeah. So we'll discuss VAT and PSUN in um, the other um, slides that are to come so that we see when you are supposed to register for those taxes. Okay, and then the next thing is um, when it comes to directors, directors are supposed to file their taxes based on the uh, rapify. So if you are a director of a company, of a cooperated company, you are supposed to file your taxes. And uh, how you file your taxes is that the company is a, in, in a company where an employee, so as an employee of an, a company, pay as you earn should be deducted on any earnings that you would have received. And on a monthly basis, the company submits returns, and on a yearly basis, they produce IRP files for all the employees, and those IRP files are shared with you. Okay. Okay, let's um, uh, have a look at um, purpose of um, accounting records. Okay, so. Our main thing here is to look at how we record our our our, our um, slips, our bank statements, our, from our source documents. So at the end of the day, that is the purpose of the accounting. Okay. I'll move on to the next slide, which is accounting record systems. So it shows us the structure of uh, where we start from. So when you, you start your own business, you would find you'll be buying things. You start by buying things. You are told to open a bank account. And when you open a bank account, you put money in the, in, in the account. So everything is kind of like confused. You are collecting slips. You've got money that you are putting in the bank. And then you start having clients. They start depositing money into the bank account. You invoice, they start depositing money into the bank accounts. And um, with that, you are collecting what we call source documents. And with those source documents, if you just keep them, you might not be able to tell where you are going. You might not be. You will find you will leave a, a, a box full of uh, these accounting records or you the best way would be for you to create files for all your invoices received for all your payments and if possible to do a payment requisition system where then everything is attached and nicely filed. It can be according to the date 
or it can be according to the supplier. So it depends with the way that you want to file. And bank statements, you should ensure from day one, we collect all the bank statements. And with the bank statements, then we also file them and also present them to our accountants. Okay, so when our accountants, or we are teaching you accounting, so you might decide to record to do your own books, which is a little bit tedious, but yeah, if you understand, then you might decide. So from our source documents, we have to record our source documents into, we have to record them into the books of prime entry. So when we say books of prime entry, we are looking at if it's your bank statements, you should have a cash book. You should have a, a cash book. So we, with a cash book in place, you are able to record all the cash that is received, whether to the bank or which is received at the office and which is um, aimed to be deposited into the account. If cash is received and it is not put into the bank account, then you might need to run and record in your petty cash. If you are using it as part of your petty cash, then you show client so, so, so paid and we use the money as petty cash. But now you would find um, there's less usage of um, cash. I know when your clients come for consultation, you might present your invoice for consultation, then they immediately pay with cash. But you find most people, the EFT into your bank account, or they can you can have a speed point, a swiping machine, where then they swipe and then the money goes to your bank. So in such a case, you are supposed to then record the money that you have received and then you record it in your cash books. And um, besides your cash book, you'll find your fees. That is, if you do work and money has been put into trust, you need to have a fee book. So with that fee book, before you can take your money, then you record, okay, I'm taking 200,000 from the trust account and uh, it's made up of a 20,000 from this client, 10,000 from that client. So that fee book, it's it does a list of the fee that you are taking from the trust account and then you are, you, are list, you, are, you are doing a list of everyone so that the amount that you are taking ties up. That is for those who take money as a lump sum or who take once a month. So for, for most practices, what they do now, they take their money from the trust account in the form of um, against one client, uh, pay client, pay client, so that you do have references. And when you give your records for e bookkeeping, then it is easier because you can trace it according to file. But if you do not do it in that way, then it means you need to keep a fee book, then that will explain to say, this 200,000 that we took, it's a split in this fashion, so that one is able to allocate against the files. Okay, and then I'm just going to, to go back a, a slide up. Okay, so that is a cash book and ledgers. Okay, the, the cash books. And then from the cash books, we, we, we have to books of prime entry. We have to post our transactions to the ledgers. So the ledgers, remember with accounting, we've got a principle of double entry. So the first entry goes to the cash book or to the prime book. Then the second entry goes to the ledger. So that our double entry is complete. So say for instance, um, we raise an invoice. So when we raise an invoice, we have to capture that into our accounting records. So the first leg it's um our fees so we indicate it in a fee invoice book so we are capturing in our invoice books and um we do our fee account so with our fee account we are crediting it with the other leg and then with our data we do our data's book 
we debit it with the amount. So those are the little T accounts that we normally do or we'll present them in assignments to come so that you can see how do we post in a ledger, how do we post from a cash book. And then once we have our ledgers and uh, cash books, so cash books, they depend on the number of bank accounts that we have. If you've got one, then you will have one cash book. But we should always have separate trust and accounting records, which means we'll have a trust cash book and we'll have a business cash book. So for our business cash book, we post into our ledgers, and then from those ledgers, then we are able to pull a trial balance. Trial balance, it's looking at the small T accounts that we have in our books. We balance them off at the end of a given period. We take their balances, whether debit or credit, group them together according to functionality, assets, liabilities, income, expenses. And when we list them together, we are forming what we call a trial balance. And that trial balance, if it balances, then it means we are recording our books in, a, in an acceptable way. We are applying our double interest concept properly. Okay, so for most um, auditors, for them to prepare financial statements or to audit your accounting records, then you present them with a trial balance. They have a look at it. If they are happy, then we are good to go. They conduct the audit. And then it's a matter of verifying what is in the ledgers to make sure that proper allocations were done and there is completeness. Okay. And if they do their audit and then they realize, oh, okay, there are issues, then they do what they call adjustments. So with the adjustments, you're looking at if ever there is any journal interest that need to be passed to correct, or it can be that there are certain transactions like uh, which are not cash based, like your depreciation that is allowed in accounting terms, then you can then do your adjustments. And then after you doing your adjustments, then you can prepare the financial statements. Financial statements needed by the bank, they are needed um, by SARS for you to be able to communicate to third parties your business position, your business performance, your business cash flows. And you can only do that by preparing financial statements. So each financial year, you're supposed to have financial statements in place. Okay, so from there, I'm going back to the slide before. In, when we are done with our financial statements, the other things, because remember we are doing low business finance, we should look at our budgets. You see, a firm should always, at the end of a financial period, do budgets for the coming period. You know, if you run with the budget, you're more of like planning for the future. And if you can meet your budgets, then they will guide you into your, how you are how you are incurring your expenses, how you are spending the money that you have forecasted, and whether you are within budget or you are outside of budget, so or whether you need to put more effort for you to get more money so that your cash flows look good. So as part of our assignment, we've got an assignment the, on budgets and cash flows. So with a budget, a budget is more of um, your income statement budget, where you look at your income, you factor in your expenses, then you calculate and see, are you making a profit out of that? And then when it comes to your cash flow, your cash flow, you are more of like eliminating um, non-cash items, like your depreciation, it's a non-cash item. So then you eliminate it in your cash flow forecast. 
And the other thing, the difference between an income budget and a cash flow is that with an income budget, you just indicate the income that you have incurred, whether you have received it, you do not worry about whether you've received it or not. So you say for this month, we have billed 100,000, then your income is 100,000. And um, in your cash flow, then you look at, okay, we have billed 100,000, we have received 50,000. And then the other 50,000 will receive it in the next month. So when you're doing your cash flows, you are then indicating we've got 50,000 for January. And then out of this 50,000, this is what we have to pay. You also align your cash flow with the payments that you have to, do, to, to make. Okay. When we go back to the budgets, say for instance, you will need to pay an auditor. So what you will do, you know, around July, August, you have to submit your audit report. So you will budget for the audit. You are more of like putting a reserve every month. You're putting a reserve where you say, okay, I'm supposed to pay 10,000 to the auditor. So you put a reserve in your budget and say, let me budget a thousand every month towards that. So a budget allows you to more of like put aside your, your, your taking into account of all your yearly expenses. You are spreading them over a period of time. And no, you, you are more of like putting resources aside in doing that. When then you go to your cash flow, even if you have to pay it in November, but you have already started budgeting it for budgeting in your income statement for it during the year. So when it comes to November, you will know you are able to, to pay because you had that thing in your budget. Okay. And then your cash flow goes with when you want to pay. So when are you paying? When are you paying? So if it's salaries, for instance, they have to be paid each month, every month. So your salaries will recur every month. If you want to increase your salaries, then when you show it in your budget to say we want to increase in March, then when you go to your cash flow, also starting March, your salaries increase. When it's rent, if it's rental, you have your rental agreements. You will know when your rental will increase, and then you also factor in that increase in your cash flow. And in your budgets, you can actually budget for other expenses and non expenses, other expenses you put in, but in your cash flow on that line item of other expenses, then you mention what is it that you have spent the money on because we, 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 we can't be so certain on what we spend on for the whole year. If we are in January, we can't tell whether in December we need to buy gifts or, you know, how much we're going to spend. It can be something that we just see as a need and then we do it. So in our budgets, you can just put it as a line item, return other, and then you're in care. Okay, so this is the purpose of accounting. It helps us with producing all these documents, the financial statements, the budgets, the forecasts for our planning purposes. Okay. All right, I will take you into bookkeeping. Okay, let's look at bookkeeping. Um, as you know, there's bookkeeping and uh, there is accounting. So what is the difference between the two? So you can have a bookkeeper and you can have an accountant, but you would find there's no need for one to have a bookkeeper and an accountant in the same practice unless if it's a very big practice because accountants can as well record your books. So you can say have an administrator who is there to collect all your information, your accounting information, that is your source documents, your, your receipts, make sure that all your receipts are properly recorded. You issue your clients with, with the receipts, you invoice your clients, all your invoices are in place, numbered, so that there's control on them. So if you have all your invoices to clients numbered, you, you, you keep them in a file, or if it's an accounting system, then you have them in an accounting system. And if it's your bank statements, 
then your administrator, you give them, they file them. And if it's soft copies, they make sure that they are in sequence and there's completeness. And when it comes to suppliers, invoices collected from advocates, sheriffs, um, for, for your matters. And so that person will ensure if it's you who is doing all that, then you ensure that all your records are kept. And then after your records are kept with for these source documents, then we need to record them. When we start recording them, then that is what we call bookkeeping. So we are taking information from source documents. We take it into our books. It can be a manual book. It can be an Excel spreadsheet. It can be an accounting system that you are using. And after we have done our record keeping, then we have our cash books, we've got our ledgers, and then from there, we have our trial balance, then we can have an accountant or even a bookkeeper can be the same person who then produces financial statements. It can be on a monthly basis. On a monthly basis, we call them management accounts. So with those management accounts, you are able to see uh, the income generated. So, so accounting is more of like taking all the information, summarize it, into one. If it's your, your 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 invoices, we say, okay, this month our income was so much. So it's coming from our invoices. We have got one global amount. If it's our telephone expense, if we're buying airtime every time, like through petty cash, through the ATM, through the bank, when we add up in that month, we are able to say we've spent so much. So accounting assists us with accounting to, to, to tell someone what has been happening. So it gives information to someone else. So we are able to tell what the outcome of our accounting reports, of our business performance, of our business position. So that is accounting. So besides just keeping the records, recording them down, recording them down, then you have to account. So accounting, normally it's... Um, good because when it comes to the LPC, they will require accounting records. So that's what you're producing to them. When it comes to SARS, they will want financial statements and they can ask for to audit those financial statements. So you produce your accounting records. Okay, so that is the difference between bookkeeping and accounting. Accounting is just going an extra mile. Okay. And um, what is the importance of uh, bookkeeping or accounting? So the importance of bookkeeping is that um, you are able to tell the, on your cash flow positions because after recording, you are able to tell how much money are we sitting with, okay? And you will be able to tell if you've got debtors, that is uh, clients who are owing money to the firm because you have recorded all your invoices that you have issued out. You have recorded all payments that have come from your clients. And then of the day you can tell this client we invest 10,000, they paid 5,000 and they are owing us 5,000. So you can come up with a list of those clients that are owing you. So you'll be able to tell who are your debtors and you'll be able to tell at any given point the creditors so if you are owing sheriffs, you haven't paid, you collect their invoices, you make payment, so you are recording these transactions, and then every day you can tell which sheriff, which advocate are you owing, you can draw up a list from time to time, and it helps. And the importance of bookkeeping, the other one, is that it allows us to to, to, to be able to to be able to report to the LPC. So they require us to submit audit reports. They require us to have accounting records. So if we are doing our bookkeeping, then that allows us that allows us to give SARS, to give banks the reports that they require. So that is very critical for any business because you cannot run in isolation. And the other importance is that we can tell the, our financial position. So 
our assets, what are our assets values? Because remember with accounting, from day one, from the time that you start with your practice, you are recording all your assets, you are depreciating them, you are showing them their current value, you have a list, an asset register that you keep, then you are able to tell these are my assets, these are my debtors, these are my creditors, and this is the profits, these are the profits that we have made from day one up to now, and after any withdrawals that are done by the, the, the directors or which are done by um, the, the business owner, you can tell these are the profits which are left. So your things should always balance, okay? That is the importance of bookkeeping. And um, when we look at bookkeeping, we look at uh, the principle of double entry. So when we are recording our books, remember we've got the debit side, which is on the left, we've got the credit side, which is on the right. Okay, each transaction that we, 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 we run through our practice, each transaction should have a debit entry and should have a credit entry. Each transaction, whether you are to go and buy water for the office, that transaction should have two entries. The first one would be when we look at buying, we are reducing our cash. Okay, and we now have uh, water. If we use it in the office, it becomes an expense. So it increases our expense. We are reducing our resources. We increase our expenses. So there's a debit and a credit. So in terms of the expense, it is the one that gets a debit. And in terms of um, the, the petty cash that we had or our bank balance, it's being depleted, then it's being credited. So you, the, the double entry system, at the end of the day, it gets explained by the accounting equation. So you need to understand the accounting equation. The accounting equation basically says our assets, less our liabilities, what we are left with, it's uh, the owner's equity. So the owner's equity, can be um, made up of um, the money that the owner has brought in, which is the capital, it can be share capital, and then it can um, also be made up of retained profits or losses. Okay, so that is the owner's equity. And um, the owner's equity can also be income, less expenses, that's where we get our retained profit. When we have our income, we list our expenses. Income, we list our expenses, we come up with our retained earnings. And then that retained earnings plus the capital that we've contributed forms our owner's equity. So that is the accounting equation. Okay. And uh, let's talk about the accounting cycle. Accounting cycle. We have done the accounting cycle. This is what we call the accounting cycle. This is the accounting cycle from source documents. We capture into prime books of prime entry, into ledgers, into trial balance. We do our adjustments. We produce financial statements. That is the accounting cycle. And um, our financial periods or financial years, when it comes to so practitioners, they are accounting periods run from March to February. So the year end is always February. And when it comes to companies, when a company is registered on the memorandum of um, incorporation, there is a portion where you stipulate the year end. So it can be any month, but the preferred one would be February. Most companies run February, some run ending December, but the best one would be February because then it aligns with almost everything, your pay as you earn, your workers' compensation submissions, any letters of earnings, it aligns with that. Okay. And um, trust audits, audits are supposed to be done on a 
yearly basis. So when you start with your practice, the LPC requires you to submit an opening audit. So with an opening audit, you have to submit it after four months. It's uh, the first four months of training and you are given in the first six months to submit it. So after four months, you, you, you have appointed your auditor, you give them your accounting records, and then after that they prepare, and then within the six months, you submit to the LPC and you are in compliance. Thereafter, then you can submit yearly. And yearly, normally, most year ends are February. So one, you can try to align everything with February so that you are given from March to August to submit. So you prepare your records, present them to your auditors. The auditors, they prepare the required docu documents. They, they do the audit, prepare the required uh, audit reports and other documents, and then you do your submissions on time. Okay, let's move on. So the next thing that we are going to look at is um, the trust and business principles. Okay. The thing that distinguishes the legal, business, legal practice from any other business is that you are allowed to run a trust account. Okay, so what is a trust account? A trust account, it's, it's an account which is according to the Act. So we've got Section 86.1, which prescribes that every um, legal practitioner is supposed to keep a trust account. To keep a trust account every. So you are supposed to ensure you open one upon registration, and you are supposed to keep it. And how do you keep a trust account? You should ensure that you constantly deposit money in it so that or if there are no transactions you are still starting you constantly deposit money in it so that it remains active because with the banks they are not supposed to they are not supposed to keep accounts for more than three months if there are no activities they are also regulated such that they are supposed to close the accounts so in your case because it's a requirement of the act section 86 one then you should ensure that you open one, you keep one, and you report on it in a like the audits on a yearly basis. Okay, so that is a trust. So a trust account. Okay, so it's not like I'm asking what is a trust. It's supposed to be what is a trust account, and um, your trust account should be opened according to section 862. Your bank statements should ensure that they put reference on the bank statement that this is a section 862 account okay so with a trust account the idea the advantage to you guys as uh, legal practitioners is that you can actually when you get a client ask them for a deposit you can ask for a deposit for your fees or for any future liabilities that you can see in running the matter. Say, for instance, you will need to engage an advocate in the matter. So you can tell them, okay, we will require an advocate in running this matter. So for you not to find yourselves having an advocate demanding money from you, you can then tell the client, put a deposit for the matter and uh, so that I'll be able to pay the advocate. And when I start giving you invoices, when you pay, then I am able to also take my fees and pay the advocate. So that is the, the advantage of a trust account. You get your monies in advance, keep them in trust, do the work, and then after you have done the work, then you can invoice the client and say, this is what we have done. Or say if you are incurring expenses in between, you can tell communicate with the client We've got an invoice from the tracer. We've got an invoice from the advocate. We are paying it. They say, okay, give you go ahead, pay from trust. Then they pay. And in your case, this is our invoice. We've done work, so much work. Can we take our money from trust? You take your money from trust. Can you top up the money in the trust account? 
for future work is instructed, then the client tops up and you keep money in trust. So the thing is that you are supposed to account for those funds of the trust account, pay client. So you should be able to trace every transaction that you have and you have uh, conducted in the trust account and allocate it to the respective client, which means you cannot just take money from trust. You can just look at your trust account balance and say, oh, there's 5,000. Then you decide I'm transferring 1,000 now. No, that is not how it works. You are supposed to know I've attended to this matter. You invoice for it. You transfer. You attach the proof so that when you give your bookkeeper, they are able to allocate. Okay. So that is your trust. And then your business, when it comes to your business, the idea, remember, it's um, for us to run a business, to make a living out of um, us going to school, becoming uh, attorneys, becoming advocates, becoming legal practitioners. So we are running a business. And the motive of a business is to make money. So which means when we bill for our fees, for anything that work that we have done, that money belongs to the business. And in us running a business, obviously, we incur expenses, we need to travel, we need to pay bank charges, we need to pay accountants, we need to pay for, for, for printing and stationery, we need to buy equipment, we need to buy furniture. So all that then forms part of our business we just need to constantly monitor it, constantly oil it, constantly work for it and keep it running. Look for clients, service the clients, get the money, account for, account for the money and also account to SaaS. So that is what we call a business, which is separate from our trust issues. Okay, so trust, trust, the trust account is to do with clients. The business is looking at, yeah, running the practice, earning fees, paying expenses. Yeah. Okay. So in us uh, doing that, I'm going to take you to the point where we need to keep separate, we need to keep separate trust and business records. So when I say we need to keep them separate, that is what the act says that is what the rules say so you need to study your rules you need to know them well you need to separate these things if you are asked for your trust records you are supposed to present your trust records if SARS wants you to account for your business records then you account for your business records for the profits and okay so if you are using say an excel for your a bookkeeping it's Excel, uh, then it means you will need to keep two different spreadsheets, two different spreadsheets. Uh, and then with those two different spreadsheets, you have one for business, you have one for the trust. And then you show the trust transfers between the business and the uh, trust account. Okay. And uh, if you're using accounting systems, Say, for instance, we are using Sage or Pastel. If it's Sage or Pastel, you need to have two databases, two databases. You can't record in one because what it does, then it mixes the transactions. So you can't mix the transactions. You can't have two cash books in one database. So you will need to have in ABC, Attorneys Inc. Trust, its own database, its own cash book, its own uh, ledgers that you run, its own trial balance that you produce, and you pay for it separately. The second one, you run it for the business, you pay for it separately, okay? But if you can look at uh, legal softwares, legal softwares, I think you can subscribe once, and uh, they can show you how to separate between trust and business, but run in the same software. It's only that with uh, legal softwares, they are a bit costly. And examples of these are like your AJS, 
your ghost practice. Yeah. So you can look at others, so you can engage them. They're a little bit costly. Okay. And the other thing with your accounting records, remember we have to keep our records for seven years. We should always constantly back up. Even if it's Excel, you need to constantly back up. You can decide to print. Of course, you know, printing does not, it doesn't mean you can keep things for years and put them into storage. They can be destroyed by water, by what. So you need to constantly make sure that you've got your backups. If ever you've got break-ins or anything, you need to then report to the police so that if ever the, you are in, you, you've got periods, then you can indicate you had break-ins or you had challenges, your, your, your systems were compromised. Okay. So from there, we look at um, trust creditors. So the thing with the trust account, the only thing that we account for there, it's our cash, which is the cash book. Every other transaction is posted against the client. And that client is what we call a trust creditor. So say for instance, you have a client um, Z and with that client Z, you receive money for litigation. They pay in 50,000. Out of the 50, then you engage in, you engage um, an advocate who then gives an invoice for 20,000. So you do not create the advocate as a trust creditor. You do not pay the advocate out of the business account because you have money held on behalf of the client in the trust account. So according to the rules, that advocate, you pay them out of trust and under the file of your client set. So when you are recording, we want we don't we won't see the advocate as a client. No, we'll see client set only with transactions which show we paid on his behalf. We paid the advocate. Okay, so those are our trust creditors, only clients. And the other trust creditor that we have would be the LPC. It will be the fund actually now for the interest. So if we earn interest which is higher than the bank charges, the net interest is due to L to the, to the fund. So that is our other only creditor that we have in our trust. And then when it comes to the business side, our creditors, we are looking for we are looking at our providers. If we get anything on credit, like uh, if our renter will say, for instance, we pay it. In, not in advance, then our landlord will be our creditor. And uh, stationary, if we are able to pay on an account, then those would be our creditors. Telcom, they bill us not in advance. And um, if it's Wi-Fi, they bill us 30 days later. But if we are paying things in advance, we don't. We, we then do not have creditors. We can expense them immediately. That creating accounts for those items. Like for instance, insurance, I know they check their money in advance. So we do not have to create a business creditor called Momentum because they will check their money in advance. We just know we've got an insurance expense we immediately expense. And then when it comes to sheriffs, yeah, they can be business creditors, but if you have money in trust, there's no need for them to be business creditors. You just pay them from the trust account on behalf of the client and then you take the money over. Okay, and then business data, these are our clients. We have invoiced them, they haven't paid us. Those are our data, they are owing. It's an asset to us, they are owing the, the practice. Okay, let's move on. Okay, let's look at. Um, statutory requirements. So we've got other, we've got um, statutory requirements when we are starting a new business. So let's consider we are starting the new practice. So the first thing that we'll need to do would be to go and register with the 
LPC with the Legal Practice Council. So now they have got provincial offices. You go to your provincial office, you go, you ask them, you complete forms. And once they confirm that you can register, then they will tell you the requirements. One of the requirements is um, for the practice to open a trust account. So you go to the bank, open a trust account, open, and also a business account. They require that you open a business account, but they would want a practice to report back and give the trust account name so that they record it on their system. Okay, and then the next thing would be they require every entity, every practice to register with FIC, which is FIC, or they normally call it, we normally call it FICA. FICA is Financial Intelligence Data Act. So you register with financial with the Financial Intelligence Center. So it's it's a um, it's it's a requirement. It's a statutory obligation. One legal practitioners are considered as report reportable institutions. So on because you, you you are holding transactions with clients where you are paid money. Uh, that money you have to speak at your client and collect documents and make sure that they do not deposit cash in excess of uh, the thresholds. If your clients do that, then you have to report them. So the idea is to look at um, money laundering, terrorist activities, so the country has to protect itself. And in terms of South Africa, that is what they've done to protect themselves. Okay. And the other thing is that as a requirement from the LPC, you need to appoint an auditor. So the auditor is the one that is going to assist you with submission of reports. And um, while you're still starting like your opening audit, if you do not have transactions, then you can, there's an exemption form, which um, the, the LPC gives to attorneys. You can apply for exemption from an audit, and then you pay 575 for them to, to look at your bank statements, you produce all your bank statements in sequence. They look at them if they're satisfied, then you do not have to engage an auditor for that period until you've got transactions. I think they look at uh, the quantum. If your transactions are of uh, big amounts, if you only have one or two and they have big amounts, then they can be subject to an audit because they don't have auditors in their offices to come and look at your files. So they expect your auditor to then come look at your files, be happy, produce an audit report and say, everything is in order and um if uh, it's just small amounts and if it was fees then they can accept probably about less than 10 transactions they can accept and then uh, as an exemption okay and uh, as an expectation from the lpc once you register with them you have to always update and reconcile the trust accounting records on a monthly basis, make sure on a monthly basis they are reconciled. They can send, especially when you are starting with your practice, they normally send someone for inspections and that person usually then comes, check if you've got cash books, you've got ledgers, and also they advise you on how to record your books. I don't know now if they still do. When I was working for the LPC, there was someone who was doing that and you would follow up on new practices and make sure that accounting records are updated. Okay, and the other thing is that when they send for also inspections, if there are issues in the firm, then they need accounting records and they should be up to date. And then the other thing, you're supposed to retain the accounting records for seven years. The current act says seven years, uh, retain them. And for SARS purposes, then you look at SARS, I think they say 10 or 15 years, you have to retain your accounting records, make sure you have them. You can always finish them when required. Okay. So our other statutory requirement is that we are supposed to we are supposed to register with SARS. So when do we register for SARS? If it's a sole practice, I guess you are registered where you were before. You continue with your 
number and uh, your tax number. Remember, the motive of opening a firm is to make a profit so that you can make a living. And with making that profit, government has got some interest in that. And through SARS, then they tax you. So the first thing is income tax. And then for companies, the moment you register a company when you're opening your practice with LPC, automatically it's given an income tax number. And then on a yearly basis, you have to account to SARS. Okay, and then for pay as you earn, we'll discuss further, but you need to register. The moment you have employees, you need to register for pay as you earn. And then SDL, only if your wage bill for the particular year exceeds 500,000, then you register for SDL. SDL, you register with SARS. And then you have to select your applicable um, CETA that in future, if you want to train, you can benefit from. So that is the idea of SDL. So they require a practice to be registered with um, SARS for SDL. And then um, UIF, the moment you employ, an, you, you, you employ you for employees in your practice, you need to make sure you register for UIF. So the new act, the, the new setup now is that the moment you have employees, you register with SARS for pay as you earn and UIF because SARS administers the UIF funds and then they pass them over to the Department of Labor. And then with the Department of Labor, it will be a matter of registering online on, on your filing system as a, as a individual, you capture in your practice and then you start declaring for your employees so that when they want to go and claim, they can go and claim. And then to register with SARS for VAT, okay, we'll discuss them in the next slides. Okay, and um, UIF uh, and Workers' Compensation Fund, I've, I've told you about the UIF, so it's through SARS, and then from SARS, then you go onto the system, you register. For the Workers' Compensation Fund, once we've got any employees, you have to register with the workers' compensation fund so that if an employee is injured at work, then you can claim or they can claim from the workers' compensation fund. Okay. Okay, let's move on with the taxes. Let's look at um, income tax. So I think I've discussed income tax. When do we register for income tax? It can be obviously every person who is having an earning should register for income tax. So you as an individual are supposed to register as an income for income tax. And then for a company, the moment you register a company, automatically it is registered for income tax. The only thing then that you need to do is to go to SARS, activate yourself as a representative of the company so that you are able to conduct or to do your filings or get your tax clearances online. Because I think now they do not issue documents at the branch. They tell you to use SARS e-filing. Okay. So as an individual, you need the other thing when you are considering your business uh, activities, whether to trade as a sole prank or prop or as a sole practitioner, or whether to incorporate, you need to compare the tax rates. Okay, so when you look at tax rates for individuals, you find they start from, I would say, 18% up to 45%, depending on your income bracket. So say, for instance, you earn uh, less than 80,000 in a year. So there is what they call a rebate. So for every individual, each year they stipulate a rebate. So like for the current year, the rebate is on 92,000 something. So if you earn anything below 92,000, in terms of income, if you are not running a business, 
that, that would be say a salary uh, interest so if it's less than 90000 then you are not paying tax but you just declare to sars then you don't pay tax and if it's um, a business you, you declare your financial so they require your income your expenses then it shows your profit so you have to prepare your financial statements in your individual capacity and then you declare it to SAS. if the profits are below threshold then you do not pay tax okay and when it comes to companies Companies are taxed on a flat rate, flat, flat, flat rate. So the current rate is 27%. So you prepare your financial statements, your income statement, where you show your income, your expenses, then your profit. And then on that profit, you are supposed to pay 27%. Okay. So let's um, look at uh, individuals. Okay, with individuals, the tax year will always end in February. It starts in March, it ends in February. So if this is your first year of running a business, you register with the LPC, you start in January. So your first tax year end will be this February, and then you start again in the new year. So for these two months, you will declare them under the 2024 tax year, which ends in February. So tax years, when we say 2023, 2023 ended in February. 2024 is the current tax year that we are in. It will end in Feb 2024, starting March 2023 to go into Feb 2024. So that is our tax years as individuals. Okay. And um, with individuals, if you are employed, you get your IRAP5, you use it to submit your taxes together with other requirements for tax, like uh, where I told you if you've got other business entities, other income, and then you do all those declarations under your individual capacity when you submit your return. Okay. But if you are a business, like in our case, you're running as a sole prop, that is your only source what you have to do, you have to register for provisional tax because there's no other way of paying tax. The only way you pay is through provisional tax. So SARS requires you to register for provisional tax and every six months you declare your provisional return, pay tax, declare your provisional return, pay tax, and then consolidate into the income tax return. Okay, so the first provisional it's uh, in August, the second one, it's in February, and then the final one, if you feel you have underpaid, because as it's the second one, you should make sure that you pay 90% of your taxes. And if you underpay, or if you feel uh, you haven't paid everything, you can do a final return, a provisional return, where you pay in the difference so that you can prepare for the future, start again the next financial year you have accounted. And then after that, you will sit down from March of the new year, prepare your financial statements. You are given 11 months after year end to prepare your financial statements. After preparing your financial statements, you, you, you then you do your tax calculations you compare with your provisional tax. Then when you submit your return, it will tell you whether you have to pay SARS or you are getting a refund. Because now you are basing it on actuals. Remember, provisionally, provisional tax is based on provisional on estimates. So you are estimating. Now you prepare according to your actual transactions. You see, oh, I over-declared. Then SARS will refund you. If you under-declared, then um, you... you, you, you get your refund okay and then the other thing for companies the tax year end like what i've said is according to the company registration document and also your provisional taxes they depend on the tax year end so it's six months the first six months 
the last day of the six months, you should have paid your first provisional tax. So if you're here in this February, just like individuals, you should ensure by August, 31 August, you have paid, declared and paid. If you do not declare and pay on time, you incur penalties. They charge from 10%, 10% penalty and then interest going forward. And then the second return is also six months from the first one, depending on the period. Because the reasons why the companies and individuals in business self-employed pay provisional tax is because they are not paying on a monthly basis like salaried people. Salaried people, the employer is supposed to withhold money and pay. Okay. So with companies, the income tax return is due after 12 months, within 12 months. Let me say within 12 months of year end. So you are given until like if you've got a February year end, you should ensure by the other February you have submitted, you've paid, you've concluded your tax matters, then you will remain compliant. Okay, so that's income tax. And then we've got um, value added tax. Okay, with uh, value added tax, when do we register for VAT? Okay, value added tax, it is, we, we have a value added tax act. So you need to have a look at the act. And then according to the act, um, anyone, any business, whether personal, in your personal capacity or through a company, through a close corporation, a trust, or through any vehicle that you are using for business. The moment you are providing goods or services, you are supplying goods or services, and you exceed a certain threshold, then you have to register for that. So the, the first one in terms of um, legally, if you exceed a million, if you can see you're exceeding a million in a 12 month given period. So you have to look at a 12 month given period. It can be any 12 months. It doesn't have to be your financial cycle, your financial period. So if you are in March and you check from April last year to March, and you see you have exceeded a million in terms of your fees, your fees excluding disbursements, then you can register for VAT. You have to register for VAT. And there should be continuity for you to register for, for VAT. You should see that there is going to be continuity in business, the supply. If there is no continuity, then there is no need for one. If it's a once-off activity, no need to register for VAT. But if there is continuity, one is to register for VAT. And um, voluntarily, if you want to register for VAT, as long as you can exceed 50,000 in your fees in a given period, 12 months, then you can register for VAT. So when you are registering, you will need to prove that to SARS. Okay, that's value added when to register. And then how to compute VAT? So we've got what we call VAT output and VAT input. Output is the VAT that we levy on our office. Remember, the idea with VAT, we are collecting money on behalf of the government. So after getting our fees, we are adding some, some, some the 15% on top of our fees we collect it and we are passing it over to government. We are entrusted by the government to collect money for them. That is the idea, which means whatever that you've collected is not for you. The only portion that is for you is you are allowed to claim the VAT on certain expenses that you have incurred. So if you have incurred an expense that is from a bad vendor, you have to, it, it, there has to be an invoice. You should have paid that VAT to someone on your expense. So say, for instance, on telephones, you incur, you, you are charged VAT. On internet, you are charged VAT. On motor vehicle repairs, you are charged VAT. So 
on behalf of your business. This is only business. Remember, we are talking business, not personal items. So you, the VAT that you have been charged, then you can claim it on the VAT that you have been paid to pass over to SaaS. You claim it. So at the end of the day, what we pay to SARS, it's your VAT output less your VAT input. That's what you pay. And um, when it comes to categories, VAT categories, we've got A or B. So these ones, it's like your odd periods or even periods. And these are two month cycles we register. When we register, we should aim to register two month cycles. Two month cycles apply to small businesses. But if you run and you become big, automatically SARS, say you exceed 20 million, SARS will automatically register you on a one month cycle where you have to submit your returns every month. So if it's a two month cycle and it's on an even period where you are supposed to say do January, February together, you will submit in March. So you are given up to the end of March to submit and pay your return. And then you do March and April, you submit in May. May and June, you submit in July. So that's an even period. An odd period, it will be like December and January together. December, Jan, you submit in February and pay in February. Feb, so you're looking at your transactions according to their dates. That's how you submit. But for your input, input you are given three years to claim. You can claim anytime. Output is the one that you should stick to the cycle as given. Okay. All right. And then the, the other thing is our VAT payable. So it is paid by the last working day of the third month. So it's your two months if it's in an event, January and February, you make sure in March you are paying. Make sure you manage. If you do not pay on time, then you will incur penalties. Okay. So you should avoid incurring penalties. All right. Okay. So the basic VAT calculations. Uh, We've got what, what we call, you are given an amount which is in, including VAT, okay? So for you to get an amount which includes VAT, so you will say, say for instance, your fees were 1,000. So for you to determine an amount including VAT, so you take your 1,000, which is excluding times 1.15. Okay, if you want to come back to the one excluding VAT, so you say you're including VAT divided by 1.15. Okay, we'll do an example where then I'll show you how to apply this. Okay, and then the VAT to take, say for instance, you are given the amounts including and you want to determine your VAT. So if you have an amount including for you to get your VAT back to, to amount, you say including times 15 divided by 115. Okay. If you are given an amount excluding VAT, amount excluding VAT, for you to calculate your VAT, you say that amount excluding VAT times 15 divided by 100 or times 15%. Times 15%, then you will get your VAT. Okay. So let's um, do a quick calculation. So you consult with a client and raise an invoice for 2,500 excluding EX, excluding VAT. Okay. You purchase a cartridge, a cartridge for the printer for 1,150. So this is supposed to have including VAT. This is excluding, this is including. So for you to, to calculate your VAT output, 
this amount is excluding VAT. So for us to calculate our VAT, it's 2,500 times 15%. So this is basically 15%. Then we get 375. And then for our output, for our input, remember our output is on the fees. Our input is on items that we have used to get the fees. So we'll take our cartridge money, which is 1,100. It's including VAT. Then for us to get the VAT to be times 15 divided by 115, and then we get 150. So to SARS, if these were our only transactions that include VAT, because if you look at salaries, that does not include VAT. So if these were our only transactions, then we were going to then say amount payable to SARS is our output 375 less our input 150 then we pay 225. Okay. So say for instance we were not registered for VAT. So how to calculate your profit it was just going to be 2500 less 1150. So you would find there is no benefit of you getting that 150 back because as it is this 150 you are now retaining it because we are registered for for VAT. Okay. And then VAT refunds. Yeah, you can get VAT refunds. How do you get VAT refunds? Say, for instance, you did not invoice anything. There is no, you did not consult, but you bought cartridges and you are registered for VAT. Okay, so on that purchase of a cartridge, so here we'll be left with a claim of 150 because we've got zero here and a 150, then it becomes a minus 150. So we can claim that 150 from, from SARS. And how do we claim it? We submit our return to SARS. Usually they then want to carry a review, the quality review, where they request you to submit supporting documents. And in this case, your supporting document will be your pictures of the cartridge. So you need to look at the requirements of the, the an invoice. They need a text invoice, should have a supplier's name, supplier address, your name, your company's name or your firm's name, your VAT number, especially on invoices which exceed 5,000, okay? And then to get a refund, it can be automatic if there are no audits required, but if they are fighting for it, they don't, they don't just refund, they also have to fight a bit and, you know, try to minimize theft or try to minimize issues of people just claiming. So they can take plus or minus three months for them to do an audit and then you get your, your refund, okay? All right, and then the, the next thing we spoke about pay as you earn, SDL and UIF. Pay as you earn, so this is for our employees. For us, if we are registered as an INC, the directors are part of the employees of the company because we are now two separate entities. Yourself as an individual, this is a juristic person or a juristic person that account for their own income, account for their own taxes. So you become an employee of that entity. Okay, so when to register for pay as you earn, if it's an INC, you can register automatically because you are the first employee. If you are going to get a salary or a pay as you are earning, you have to pay SARS. And then for if uh, and then a sole prop, the moment you get an employee, you have to register for pay as you earn. Automatically, SARS registers you for UIF. Why? Because they are the custodian of UIF funds, they administer, they receive, and then from there, you can then register for UIF just for declarations. And then when it comes to, to SDL, SDL, if, if you foresee that the wage bill, including your salary, for the year exceeds 500,000, then you have to register for SDL. Or you can register whenever it is about to reach the 500,000, you register 
and then you make sure that you do the declarations. SGM is usually 1% of the gross income. UIF, it's 1% from the employee, 1% from the employer, and up to a threshold. So you need to check out the thresholds. I think currently it's 17,712. So it can change any time. You just need to check those thresholds. Okay. And um, the deductions. So each time on a monthly basis, you are supposed to deduct. So what you can do is that you can utilize uh, the tax tables. So if you can Google their tax tables online, which are done on a weekly basis, fortnight basis, monthly basis, yearly basis, they will show you like the monthly ones, how much tax to deduct on a certain salary. So what you also need to know is that if uh, someone does the ends say less than 8,000, they are below the threshold of paying tax. So they won't be paying, your employee won't be paying tax, but they have to pay UIF. If you are registered for SGL, they have to, there's SGL and UIF payable on their salary. So there's a UIF employee portion, there's a UIF employer portion. SGL is only paid by employers. Okay. And then the other way would be for you to use payroll systems. You can look at, um, there are a lot of payroll systems out there. You can look at search payroll, you can look at tally, then you use them and you do your payroll on a monthly basis. And uh, pay as you earn, SDL and UIF are payable by the 7th of the following month or the last working day before the 7th. So say the 7th is falling on a Saturday, then you have to do your returns by the 6th, which is the fact you have to pay. You can do your returns early, but payment should be with SARS by the 6th. Okay? And or by the 7th, if it's a working day. All right. So if the 7th is on a Sunday, then you make sure by the 5th you are done, paid, returns submitted, then you will not incur any penalties. If you do not submit by the 7th, then there's a 10% 10, 10 penalty. Because remember, you are deducting this money from these people who have earned. So the firm was supposed to pay the person in full, but they've got an obligation to deduct and pay over to SARS. That's how we end up paying SARS. It's, it's an obligation according to the fourth schedule of the Income Tax Act. So an employer is given, it's according to the act, they just have to deduct, okay? So if you do not deduct from an employee and it happens that SARS conduct an audit, you, the, 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 the employer, you as the employer or the employer, the company will have to pay for those employees even if you did not deduct. So the obligation falls on you and if you do not do it, then you will pay for it. So it's not worth not doing. So you'd rather then just register on time, make sure you're deducting, you're paying on time. You present your employees with their IRP fives at the end of the year, they file their own personal returns, then it becomes their responsibility. Then as a citizen, you become a better citizen. Everything is done on time, okay? I've explained directors are, they, they, they form part of the company. And um, you need to then get into detail because how to account for travel allowances, how to account for medical aid medical aid contributions, how to account for pension contributions, for retirement annuity contributions. You need to look into that. If you are using an accounting system or an accountant, they can advise you on that, on how to cater for that. So, because on your own, it can be too much, and then you can end up running for longer hours, become tired, business fail. Okay. And then for sole practice practitioners, sole practitioners, advocates, they can register for pay as you earn under yourself. You pay on a monthly basis so that your tax at the end of the six months provisionally it becomes less or at the end of the year, it becomes less. But your obligation is still, you're supposed to declare 
tax based on profits rather than what you have earned. You can't say I withdraw from the business 120, so I pay tax on 120. You have to go back income, less expenses. What is the profit? If the profit is 70,000, you pay, you, you then declare 70, you pay according to that. If the profit is um, a million and you have only taken 120, then you pay according to a million. Okay. So that is pay as your NSDL and you are, if you've got any queries, then you can put on the platform, then we explain further. The last thing that I'm going to touch on this webinar would be uh, insurance. Okay, so insurance is good for you. There is what they call professional indemnity. I think that one you have heard. That is, uh, if you are sued in your personal capacity or as an ink, you are sued together with the ink. If you have professional indemnity, then you are able to claim from the insurance, then they cover the claim for you. So it is a very important um, thing. And then there is uh, income protection. Income protection, say for instance, um, something happens to you uh, and you can't earn income anymore. So with an income protection, you would find if anything major happens, you will be able to receive some income until such a time you can come back and work. So usually they stipulate, they can say two years, they can say um, we first cover the two years, then thereafter you can do it for a lifetime. So it all depends on the premiums that you, you are paying. And then also insurance, we should insure our assets, like our motor vehicles, short-term insurance for our equipment in the office. We do it using uh, short-term insurance. There are companies like uh, Momentum, there are companies like um, Budget Insurance, like uh, Outsurance, so you can engage them, then you can um, insure your assets so that if ever there is a mishap, there is going to be business continuity. When you get paid, you can buy assets, you go back in business and insure your, even your offices, you buy offices, you insure them so that if ever there is a mishap, then you are covered and you can continue as a business. Okay, and then the other last insurance that I will discuss is the key man insurance. So it usually applies where there are two partners or directors, or if you are the only person, and then you have, a, say, a junior. A associate or in attending the office that you feel I need to insure. So in the event that that partner dies or in the event that they leave within a certain stipulated time, then the insurance company can pay you so that you can cover yourself. So key men is very important, especially where there are partners and directors where the company has to be dissolved upon the death of a partner. So you can stop the company from being dissolved in that you then pay out of the insurance proceeds and then you limit from losing the business. Okay. I don't know if you've got uh, any questions. Um, you can ask on the platform and we've got the forum. So you can go on the forum and uh, post questions and then we'll be able to answer you. And also remember to first of all, go through the guide. It will give you more information. If ever I've left other things out, it's because I'm just doing skeletal and then I'm just trying to cover a lot for you. Okay, thank you so much for listening to the webinar and uh, I wish you well with the course and see you in the next webinar. Thank you. I am going to stop.